Yo, 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 what's up? We're trying to figure this stuff out. Let's uh, add John to the show, and let's add even a wild Jarrett Smith to the show. Woo-hoo. Morning. What's going on? The bass has dropped, allegedly, as we uh, try a new way of broadcasting the show. There's some differences, uh, but there's some good trade-offs as well. So we are working through all of this different stuff. Um Thanks for joining us in 2022, New Year, figured uh, new us, you know, all those different things. Uh, LAFC has just allegedly hired a manager while we go live. They knew what was happening. They knew it was a new year. They knew how they wanted to start this thing. Steve Terundolo will be the new manager of LAFC. It's not Ronaldo Paiva. Um, I don't know how this is going to go, guys. Um He's a guy with very little experience. His limited experience is one year in charge of Las Vegas Lights, which was basically a reserve team for LAFC. Um, he has a good bit of youth coaching experience um, after his career in Germany ended, but that's a little different. And this is a very high pressure gig, John. Um, not your easiest first coaching gig. No. And. and- for me, th- this is where the palace intrigue starts, okay? So you go with the guy who was in charge of your club that you were associated with in the USL Championship, so he's he knows the younger players, and that element is, is taken care of a little bit with the knowledge base, but now what kind of player comes in to be the, the high-profile player that is going to be there for Steve Chirundolo in a very high-pressure situation, high-demand situation internally for this club and, you know, we've talked about Steve Chirundolo in the past as someone that should get a manager gig. And so, OK, you've gotten your manager gig in Major League Soccer. It's with LAFC. Welcome to Monday. Welcome to 2022. This one this one is an interesting one. I want to see where it goes when it comes to personnel that are added from this moment forward. Yeah, I, I'm I'm intrigued to see how LAFC fans handle this as uh, Alex Bassine is already throwing uh, shade. At us, you know, that's what he does. Um, I've wondered, we've had the conversation when there's been the talk about front offices and reactions. And we've got things to talk about with Atlanta United because of uh, interesting rumors. And they are very rumor-ish right now. Uh, but John Thorrington generally hasn't been criticized too heavily for where LAFC is. I feel like when you look at what they did in their first two years, it's amazing. They win the supporter shield in year two. They come up short in the postseason. Year three was a year of COVID. It was very, very different. Um, But they didn't exactly look great dealing with it. Vela had injuries. Vela had injuries again in 21. They didn't make the postseason in 21. It's went downhill and now going into their year five, there's a ton of questions. Is Vela going to be back? That seems to still be up in the air, even though he's under contract. atuesta has gone. They still haven't really addressed the back line, although they have a lot of bodies there now. I mean, Jarrett, when we get into LAFC, now that we know who the manager's going to be, what is your expectation level of the black and gold? Um. Yeah, I honestly don't know what to expect of them right now because it should be a team that's changing things out a bit. And uh, with with that comes, you know, do you continue down the road that you had already set? Um, do you go do you go big with with signings, or do you you know try and develop through your academy? I don't really. I think they're kind of at a crossroads right now. That's it's okay. It's every team goes through this. Every expansion team, especially, is going to go through this. Um, I think I think there was a time when we might have expected Bob Bradley to be there for longer than he was. And maybe if last year goes the way they hoped it would, maybe he is still there. I'm not really sure what that relationship was like, but it seems very odd. Uh, it seems it seems like a very odd shift for them in a sense because you have gone from this, um, you know, this this high flying, you know, poster on the wall to we don't really know. It might still be that. But we're just we're not going to know right now. We got to wait and see how the rest of the offseason goes for them. It's going to be a very busy one. And uh, uh, hey, if you want to see another GM get flack other than Carlos Bocanegra, go look at LA because my God, you're going to light him up for every day that there's not a signing 
even though that's totally unrealistic. And we screamed that to the heavens about Atlanta and other town and other teams. Like you don't get a signing. You don't get a huge rumor every single day. It's not how it works, but man, with so much that they still have to do, whether you know, it involves Carlos Vela, whether it, it involves uh, replacing guys who have been sold, which is nothing wrong with that. I mean, you want to, you want to move guys on and make money in the process and then bring in guys and grow them. But you, it, it's a matter of making it repeatable. I don't know what this is going to look like with Steve Turundlo, uh taking over, but especially with some of the younger players, there should be some benefit. He's going to know some of them and uh, have an understanding with them. And we've talked about the benefits that that can have with Atlanta United pushing player, pushing manager, excuse me, from their academy to their second team. Yeah, the the thing about LAFC is I'm not sure how vocal the dissent has been in 20 and 21 about the front office. I don't think it was really there, even though I I don't think they achieved as much as maybe their hype would lead you to believe it has picked up now. And it picked up when Bob Bradley left and there wasn't an immediate hire. And and that's where I feel like it's going to get even bigger because Steve Trundolo is a U.S. men's national team legend. He has the potential to be a very good manager. He probably is a very good coach right now, but is he a good head coach, which is a little bit different than being an assistant? Is he ready to be a manager of a club with big expectations? He's not a slam dunk hire. He's not even the same kind of hire that you had previously with Bob Bradley. So, one, I wonder what the reaction is going to be from the fan base just to the hire. Just first off, how do they react to Chirondolo? Probably going to get some goodwill because of his time with the USMNT, but how much? And then if they start slow, how how fast does the heat get going on him? Um, I don't know. I mean, Johannes, I agree with you, and I do too, in terms of, like, I like Chirundolo as well. I love his his career. I loved him as a player. It took way too long to get him into the, the National Soccer Hall of Fame. But he has no track record. And if this was a Dallas, if this was a Minnesota, Colorado, okay, get it. I, I think that feels like the kind of spot where he would get his first managerial gig. And I, I do put the Las Vegas lights gig to the side a little bit. LAFC is not that LAFC has, I, I think a very different kind of expectation. And is he going to be okay there? He's He's got the personality where I think he handles it, but what if he needs a little bit of time? What if he has some growing pains? What what if? And we'll just have to see. I mean, John, it, it's with Chirundolo there, it feels like the conversation around LAFC might need to change from being the team that is expected according to the odds. I mean, the, the odds that are out there right now, LAFC is among the favorites to win M- the MLS Cup in 2022. Yeah. They're right there at the top of the the odds. Should that change with a new manager? Does that make it harder for Chirundolo to come in and do a good job straight away? I think so. And, you know, as we're having this conversation, you know, we could run the joke again that LAFC has gone up two more in the power rankings. But I can think we get a, Can we get a new joke in 2022, please? It, yes, please. Let's get a new joke. So, so no much. So I, I honestly don't know what the patience level of the 3252 and for LAFC fans in general is going to be considering their self-imposed expectation of being a favorite to win MLS cup to, to be at the top of the West. And I think especially after last year and not being a part of the discussion, I would think that LAFC fans are going to want the return to greatness and the same discussion that they're having in Toronto by bringing in Bob Bradley. And when you have two well, more. A little bit different discussion now, right. though, because of the hires. Right. I know. but And I think that and I just don't think. And this is just me looking at it at face value without. Fans looking and trying to understand what Chirundolo has to work with and has to develop over time. I just think that the way that fans are for the most part these days 
you have that instant gratification. They want the instant gratification. Okay, we've got a hire. We need to get back to where we were. So, okay, great, fine. It doesn't matter who the hire is. We need to get back to where we were. We need to get back into the part of the discussion to be Western Conference champions. We need to be fighting for MLS Cup. I, I just don't know if the patience level is going to be there with Steve Chirundolo as it should be early on in 2022 if things start out slowly because they're trying to get adjusted to how he wants things on the field. Burns says uh... – Trendelow has no track records, not entirely true. Um, no, it's 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 entirely true that he does has no track record as the manager. That that's all I'm saying. Let's let's make that clear. Um, he hasn't been a manager. So I mean that that part's true. Now he doesn't have he has the one year as a reserve team manager, which is what Las Vegas was this past year, which is different. It's a different gig. And we had this conversation about Stephen Glass when he got the opportunity with Atlanta United. It it's basically like the assistants getting jobs. It is. However, my question has been: Is LA going to accept that? And is he ready? Because I don't think. And if I'm wrong here, I'm, I'm wrong. It, trust me, it wouldn't be the first time. I don't think he has as much first division assistant coaching experience as even a Gonzalo Pineda coming into Atlanta. I don't think he had that. So this is a job with more risk than a Gonzalo Pineda than the other assistants who have gotten promoted in MLS for multiple reasons. Um, I think he has less experience than them. I think also he has less experience with Major League Soccer than them. And we know how much of a challenge that can be. MLS can be a different animal. Um, he did get the year with Vegas that will help him in that regard of just travel and, and how disruptive it can be. And hopefully you're going to be traveling in a much better way in LA versus what you were doing out of Vegas. But still, um, it's not the same as hiring Bob Bradley ahead of year one. And LAFC has generally not had the question marks and the uproar and all of that about anything they've done. Does this get that is my question. And should they be a favorite in the West? I don't think the hiring of Terundolo makes them more of a favorite. I didn't think they were a favorite in the first place. I think when you look at their roster right now and you have that Carlos Vela question, although he is under contract and, you know, there were the the reports when he was re-upped that, hey, he's going to want more money or he's going to want to be moved. All that stuff's gone quiet here. So if Vela's going to be there, okay. You have Arango, great great signing late in the season last year. You have Brian Rodriguez, who we know is going to be angling for a move at some point, but it's not there yet. They've lost the Tuesta. They traded Mark Anthony K last year. They have bodies defensively, but are they going to be much better defensively? Uh, Diego Palacios on the left side, very good. Is, on the right, is it going to be Kim Moon Juan? Is it going to be Franco Escobar? Okay. In the middle, Eddie Segura, back. Mamadou Fall showed how good he can be. Does Escobar go into a three center back setup or does Jesus Murillo get the opportunity? Um, you have Ibiaga for depth. You have Tony Leone for depth. You have Marco Farfan who's going to push Diego Palacios on the left. Mohamed Traore is a very promising teenage left back. Uh, Julian Gaines is an option on the right side as well. You have a lot of bodies, but I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if they're going to play a line of five. They're going to play a line of four. I don't know if Escobar is a center back or a right back or if he starts with this group. I don't know where this goes. Um, I hope it's a good hire, guys. I, I I like Chirundolo. I want it to work out well. But I also think you have to be careful about the fact that he was a player that was very good. And he was a player especially who played in the Bundesliga that was very good. That doesn't guarantee that he'll be successful as a manager anywhere, let alone in his first big gig. So it's a, it's a really... A blank slate, Jared. I mean, this could go any different direction you can imagine. I think for anybody walking into L.A. this season with any level of experience, it's a tough spot because of the expectations and because of just maybe the, the questions as we went through that roster and went to that lineup. Like, I don't really know what their 11 is going to look like game to game. Some of it's going to be down to the, what the manager wants to do, but I don't think it's a I don't know what the expectation is for L.A. I mean, where would you put them next season? Where would you put them in the West? 
Um, I guess let's talk it out. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Well, you got your um, top three. Okay, let's go top four yeah. because Portland made MLS Cup. Yeah, they were fourth, but then your top three rotated all year long between Colorado, between Seattle, between Sporting Kansas City. Yeah, has LAFC done anything, or is it just expected they'll be better than they were last year? Have they done anything to jump any of those teams? Maybe Portland. I think they've done enough to jump them. And my question with Vela is, Vela can still be really good. Vela is also in his uh, approaching his mid thirties, so two injury plagued is- years. Yeah, and this is my thing where, you know, you want to get into a discussion about guys making these comebacks. Uh, yeah, Joseph's coming back, uh, you know, after having, I guess, let's call it a rehab year. Um, or just scored double-digit goals. Yeah, Joseph's also 28 years old. <laughs> yes. Vela's, you know, 33, 34. Uh, let it, let's get that confirmed. The, uh, I mean, might be one, two, but it's, the, num- it's, the first question is, is he there? He'll be 33 um, very early in the season. Is he going to be there? And after the last two years he's had where he didn't play a lot in 2020 at all, every time he came back, it felt like he got hurt again. Um, Last season, he had long injury absences. I mean, he's played, he started 19 games over the past two seasons. He's played in 27. So he's basically got one full season out of the last two. I mean, you're looking at this point for, and, and here's the thing, you know, we can talk about this. I expect them to make a move because I don't think LAFC wants to be that team that just kind of sits pat and rests on the laurels in that sense. So, I mean, I'm expecting them to make a move to bring in somebody to kind of try and replace that Diego Rossi energy. And that's going to be tough to do because, you know, Rossi, I mean, I remember when he came in in 2018, there was that they, they just, they, you know, they were scoring a ton of goals in 2018, but I, I vividly remember us watching them. And thinking like, wow, Diego Rossi is really good. And he's just, he's always making the last pass. And then he stopped making the last pass and started making the pass of the ball into the net. It was very entertaining. You know, how do they kind of recapture that? We asked the same thing about Atlanta when, you know, when you saw Miguel Amaron leave, uh, when you kind of, you kind of shifted the way that attack looked. Can you recreate it with different pieces? Can you recreate it by making it look different altogether with a different set of players who might have different skill sets? I don't really know with LAFC. I don't know that they've done enough right now to challenge those top three, be, mostly because not even just raw talent, but they were so damn inconsistent last year. That's a team that on one day you think, wow, that team could be a top four team. And then you'd see them a week later and go, I don't know if they'll make the playoffs. They were just so up and down. And for them, it was more down than up, which is how you end up missing the playoffs. But I, I don't think they've done enough right now, but it's also early in the window and early in the off season, or early ish in the off season. I know the off season is short this year. It is the what third day of January, and I think that the fireworks will be plentiful with them on the rumor front. What that turns into, we shall see. You know, where are the rumors going to come? This is the thing that I can't quite get my head around LAFC coming into this year. I, I almost wonder if they need to tear it down a little bit to be able to build whatever team Chirundolo wants to build. And, you know, I mean, I, I guess that's one big question coming in is what is his philosophy? What is his idea? Um, I don't really know. And, and, and that's okay. I mean, I, he'll have to answer that pretty quickly and, and we'll see if there's any moves that correspond to whatever idea he has. I mean, that's uh, when you get into kind of philosophical conversations about roles of managers and teams and what they are. Cesar Luis Menotti, the legendary Argentine manager, the idealistic of the two Argentine like tent poles of, of managerial philosophy and tactics and conversation and all of it. Uh, you have Bilardo, who won the 86 World Cup, who was the realist the the pragmatist he he built that team to be able to defend well and let maradona be maradona 78 world cup winners minotti was the very our way of 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 playing the argentine way of playing to let players express themselves He, he wanted it to be beautiful 
Um, he definitely was kind of the old school mentality when it came to Argentina. Minotti said the manager's role is to to create the idea, the idea of of what the team is. Okay, what does Chirundolo do with that? He doesn't have a ton of wiggle room to do it because you look at this group right now and you have Orango up top. That's that's set. That's locked. You have bench options up top as well. Okay, you've got depth. You're good. On the wings, you've got two. Brian Rodriguez and Ismail Tajori Shradi that they've added. You know, you added Tajori Shradi for a pretty significant haul in terms of allocation money. So are they counting on him? Because if they are, then I don't know if they're looking to, to get a Rossi kind of replacement. If Vela's there, he's going to be your 10 or you're going to flare him out wide. And you might ask Brian Rodriguez to come inside. I don't know if that works. But if you play Vela as a 10, then you're playing some combination of Francisco Janela, Jose Sefuentes, Latif Blessing behind him. Okay. All those guys are kind of established as to who they are right now. We went through the back line. I mean, is it three center backs with some combination of Segura, Mamadou Fall, Jesus Murillo, Franco Escobar? Is Escobar a right back pushing Kim Moon Juan to the bench? Is Escobar a wing back? with Murillo, Fall, and Segura as your center backs. Palacios and Farfan will battle it out on the left. Palacios should get the bulk of the time. And they need a goalkeeper. Now, goalkeeper's one position they'll go out and upgrade unless unless they're going to stick with the young Tomas Romero, who was okay, and he, you would expect he's going to grow. They need depth there. They've got a lot of pieces, John. Like This is what's weird about LAFC is you've got a manager coming in that we have questions about, don't know what his idea is going to be. He's got some flexibility. I mean, he could play three. He could play four. He could play a line of five if he wants to build that way. They could play in transition with the way they play. They could play in possession. They could play pressing because they've done that some, although you've got some questions about some of the bodies you have now in terms of pressing. It's kind of a blank slate in some ways, but you have all of the pieces there you're not going to be able to go out and add other pieces very easily without moving people because of, of your roster. Right. And I think that the experience that Chirundolo had last year at Las Vegas, I think that we could see some of those faces that he was with last year as a part of that depth to fill in your roster, working their way. If they prove themselves to, to be worthy of it coming from Vegas and being a part of the LAFC roster, Kevin Baxter came out with an article at the LA times about a half hour ago. And a couple of paragraphs in it from Baxter, although LAFC will, be, will open training camp in two weeks, missing nearly a dozen players from last year. Torundolo says he expects to play a possession oriented attacking style like the one the club used to great success under Bradley. Quote, we want to be able to score and create chances and beat teams. He said we are accustomed to a way of playing in L.A. and a lot of that will be similar with some subtle changes End quote. So that's okay. The- early thought from Chirundla. Okay. I mean, that's, that's pretty vague, but that's, that's the basics. I, I guess the biggest question will be how much do they press? Uh, because that was a big factor with Bradley. I could absolutely see it being a, a factor here, but they're not going to press to like, they're not going to play to just create the press, which is the way that like a Red Bulls team will do. Philadelphia does where they don't want the ball. Everything is based off creating the pressing situations. L.A., Atlanta, teams that will press at times to get the ball back to play. So how much, what does it look like? Those are all things that a a manager can tweak and do different things. Some guys will try to win the ball back very aggressively by man-to-man, like closing people down, getting a little physical. Some people will, will try to jump into the passing lanes a little bit more, create interceptions, and then create those breaks. That's an easy tweak. You know, the, the shape is not the, the hugely important thing here because he's got some flexibility there. But is that group that we we went through the roster, is that group subtracting a Twesta, adding the pieces that they've added, like to Jory Shradi, Escobar, expecting maybe a little bit more from a Janela, from a Sefuentes, is that group good enough to reach the expectations that LAFC has? Uh, we'll find out. And we'll see if Trendolo can get them there. But that is going down. LAFC, uh, as Byrne predicted, Steve Trendolo is going to be the manager. They were not really linked heavily with other people. And I wonder 
and this is something John Thorington will ever be able to answer publicly. I wonder if they went for other people and it didn't work out and they knew Terundolo was in their back pocket because he was at Vegas, which is their reserve team. Um, did they hire him initially to come to Las Vegas, knowing that Bob Bradley was going into the last year of his deal, knowing that this was a possibility? Um, did they groom him? Was this always the plan? If it was, I think maybe the hire would have happened a little bit sooner. But this is the direction LAFC is going to go. And I'm very curious to see the fan reaction early in the season to early results, to see how this goes. But We'll get into that. Um, let's get into the conversation around Atlanta United right now, because a lot of people are, are, are getting into that. There was a podcast that reported about offers, unnamed teams, all very vague for Miles Robinson, and that the club didn't want to sell for the rumored five to eight million dollar offer. And now it's created a roar. Because this is what we do, right? 2022 is no different. The MLS hating, which is maybe strong, but I don't know really any other way to put it, section of the US MNT fan base is he's got to go, he's got to go, they got to sell him, sell him for whatever, they got to let him go. Why could they ever do this? I think the more realistic, like, hey, these are clubs that function to also protect their own interest and look out for players, are like, well, Five to eight is not enough. Number one in all of this is this is not coming from reputable sourcing that there is an offer on the table. So let, let's not jump to drawing sides and having a duel at dawn. Okay. There's nothing reputable about the conversation about there, there's an offer on the table. Is there one? There could be. Five to eight feels low. But could there be an offer on the table from a Bundesliga club? Sure, there could be. There could not be. It, 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 there's nothing really to get ramped up about it yet now. That's number one. And that's the most important thing, as we've, we've talked about going into silly season. You're going to get rumors from a variety of sources. Some sources are good. Some sources that are good still get things wrong. Some sources are top, top tier, like your Fabrizio Romano's. Some sources are more questionable, but have gotten things correct. And some sources are anonymous, and, and you don't really know what to put into it. And then some are coming from people that you know have been in the not-so-good rumor side of things quite a bit. So you put leaving less stock into that. This one, I have no idea. I don't know if it's legit or not. But as we've seen in Atlanta United's history, we can go through the list. If the offer is good for the club and for the player, they're going to make the deal. If the player wants to make the move, that is going to ramp things up. There's been no indication of Miles Robinson angling for a move right now. Does he want one? I don't know. Does he not want one? I don't know. He hasn't said. So people are jumping to conclusions and people are using Instagram posts as, as part of the justification there, which is always a slippery slope. I don't know if there's a legit offer on the table, but if there is legit interest and if there is legit interest on the player side wanting to go, there's not a lot of history to show that the club hasn't made a move to sort out the player. I mean, Jarrett, you bring up um, Carlos Carmona many times in that situation, which was one where it was not advantageous for the club to let him go when they did, but they made it work. And it was a, uh, that one, and that one was, you know, that was, you know, a family issue with him with, you know, wanting to be closer to his wife who was having a baby. And, uh, it, it worked for everybody. It was, t it was a tough one because yes, I, I, yeah, I still have an award named after Carlos Carmona. I still pine <laughs> for 2017 Carlos Carmona because I thought he was wonderful in 2017. Um, he, he also has the first red card at Lightning United history, guys. Don't forget, um, he did. our special boy, but <laughs> they managed to get him down to Colo Colo and it made it work for all parties. So I, I guess just having, I'm, I'm always fascinated by the speculation across the board on stuff like this, because the, the thing that, here's the thing that pisses me off the most about it. <clears throat> you have the, the initial 
message that Atlanta United, uh, the Atlanta United has allegedly received offers in the range. What was it? Eight to 10, six to 10, something like that. Um, five to eight is, I think, eight, what sorry. was being yeah, reported by that. this podcast. And then the end of it is, you know, Atlanta's not willing to sell at that price. Well, then it starts getting retweeted with, oh, Atlanta's not going to sell. Right. No, don't leave out the last part of this. This is the thing that pisses me off about we do on the internet a lot. When we retweet something, when we pass something along, a lot of times we'll retweet it and we basically play a really trash game of telephone where we, <laughs> you know, add something extra or take something out of the conversation to to make it fit your grumpy ass narrative. Right. Like I don't know what I don't know what the offer looks like. If I had to now, if I had to guess. I say this with no inside knowledge on this. If I had to guess, and here's how I would handle Miles Robinson, is honestly, the United States looks like they're in really good shape to make a World Cup. We can all agree on that. Miles Robinson looks like he's in really good shape to be either the starting center back on that team or if something weird happens, he's going to the World Cup if the United States makes a World Cup, barring injury. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hanging on to him until after that World Cup where his value might skyrocket on the, on the international stage. That's how I personally would handle it. Now, if Miles Robinson has something else that comes up that, you know, that, that creates a weird situation, you know, it doesn't have to be exactly like the Carlos Carmona, but you know, something that has to be addressed by the club, then yeah, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to adjust yourself accordingly. We were literally just ran into this, by the way, with the Franco Escobar thing. Um, with the the stories that came out there after Franco Escobar spoke that, you know, once he wasn't a part of the plans, they worked to get him a loan deal back to, you know, back to uh, where he wanted to go. You know, it wasn't, we're going to send you to Siberia. You haven't done anything to lead me to suggest so far that they're going to send a player out to Siberia or freeze them out or, or, or hold them hostage. Um, Miguel Almiron does not count in this conversation because that was negotiating uh, through agents with a Premier League club, and it was just as weird and crazy as you would expect because it was Premier League negotiations. It was also dealing with Mike Ashley in Newcastle, which is a whole uh, different world. Yeah, and it was and it was agents trying to work both sides of the table to make sure they get the best deal for their client themselves. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm very frustrated by the way the game of telephone is often played with social media with stuff like this of oh they're not gonna no, they don't want to sell him at that dollar they're not gonna sell him they're not gonna they're not they're gonna do what's best for them and screw the player like no Either, one of you is incorrect in in your in your in your message what messaging one of you is incorrect in this instance so y'all need to get put your heads together and figure out what was actually said and you know we'll see what happens they don't call it silly season for nothing y'all yeah the reactions get silly um if you missed the original starting point of this uh the thief america podcast posted on their twitter account american thief f-i-f uh breaking u.s men's national team international miles robinson has two firm offers from bundesliga clubs around five to eight million but atlanta will not sell at that price that is the that is where this originated from. Um, I I don't remember this podcast and the people involved in it breaking news before about offers like this. Doesn't mean it can't happen now. Let's be clear. But that is the the sentence from them. Two firm offers around five to eight, which is a pretty wide range. But Atlanta will not sell at that price. That's it. Um. I agree with some of the comments on, on the Twitch pitch already. Uh, look, if you're trying to compare this to Aaron Long, you're you're making things up. You're connecting dots that don't connect because one, Miles Robinson is a much more, I think, marketable player than Aaron Long was when the offers were there for Aaron Long. The Red Bulls, it was surprising that they didn't sell at the point that they didn't sell because he's a little bit older. What Jarrett says is very important. Miles Robinson should be part of the U.S. men's national team at the upcoming World Cup at the end of the current MLS season. There is a very good chance that whatever the offer is now will be more next January. That would lead you to if it is possible, which it might not be because the player might want the move now and you might need to make the move in regards to that because 
it's never an easy thing to do to keep an unhappy player in the fold. Thomas Tuchel's dealing with us right now with Romelu Lukaku and all of that madness, which we'll get into. It, there's nothing really concrete about any of this right now. That's the number one element. So anything that is spinning off of that, Anything about, well, they should sell because he's a national team player and he should go to Europe because there, there's special things in the water in Europe that make you a better player. Um, obviously, he could be better if he's over there and playing at a club or sitting on the bench or whatever, training it, because that, that's what happens. That's, that's supposed to be what's better. No, that, that, there's nothing about that. Well, they, they, they shouldn't sell because that's not enough money, blah, blah, blah. None of this is real yet <laughs> because we're dealing with vagaries right now. There's nothing about it at this point that is, is anything concrete. So hold your powder a little bit, relax, and we'll see what happens here. But that's the the rumor that is new from yesterday is that there are offers from Bundesliga clubs around five to eight million from the FIFA America podcast, which their Twitter account um, has twelve hundred followers and uh, Deutscher Yank is an, an anonymous Twitter account that is a co-host of the show um, with 1,200 followers. That is what is there on it. Um, again, there is nothing to rule out that they could have information that nobody else has had yet. There's nothing to definitively say that. But you do have to take these things into account when you start getting worked up about these rumors, John, of... This is what we this is what is being tweeted. Yeah. That's all we have right now. It doesn't mean it's legit. It doesn't mean it's not legit. It's just there. And yeah. there, there's nothing to get too worked up about yet with this because there's nothing concrete to work around. And that's the key is that just because somebody says something doesn't mean it's 100 percent true. Doesn't mean it's 100 percent false yet. Because we don't have all of the information that you need in this particular case to sit there and say definitively yes or definitively no. This gets back into our discussion that we always have this month out of the year and in any transfer window. Always check your sources. 1,200 followers, okay. Uh, anonymous, it does, but it doesn't mean just because they have 1200 followers that there is nothing to it, let's, right? Let's be real here, yes. but this is not Fabrizio Romano tweeting this either, right? So, take everything into its proper context when it comes to things like this, and to the notion that Atlanta United doesn't want to sell at a particular price. Why should they be beholden to a particular price that could be below the value of the player, especially in a World Cup season, in a World Cup year, where the player's value could skyrocket if things continue to trend upwardly as they have? Now, one thing, we don't know the value of the player here. Right. That is the number one element. And, and that is what you have to understand when it comes to MLS players going to Europe. The valuations are changing very quickly. Transfer marked has Miles Robinson at 5.5 million. We've talked about it for years. I feel like transfer marked is still undervaluing players in MLS. Um, I think the numbers of, of what players are getting sold for backs that up. It's the same thing as the franchise valuations. When the sale prices are going above and beyond the valuations, okay, that's just that, that's real. The sale prices on players are above and beyond the valuations. We've, we've seen the numbers on Ricardo Pepe. It's you're talking 20 million U.S. dollars. Um, we saw the Brian Reynolds numbers. I mean, there's there's so many that are happening right now that 5.5 to me feels very low. But what is the the market value? Is it is it eight? Is it ten? Is it twelve? Is it fifteen? I, I don't know. I don't know. My my gut tells me around 10 is where you want to get to on the bottom end which eight's not that far off of by the way and you can make that up pretty easily and you can make that up with performance incentives you can make that up with sell-on fees you can make that up with different things i think five is too low i think 5.5 is too low i'd start it at 10 but i don't know you know we we don't know because that market john is changing so fast mm -hmm. for mls players to go to europe it's just it, it's it's a guessing game. Yeah, I mean, when you're looking at Ricardo Pepe and you see a 20 come across the board, 
and the numbers for American talent going overseas, they're increasing as we go. And you shouldn't sell for the sake of selling. You shouldn't just go ahead and do something like that. Once again, the player hasn't said, wants to go to Europe. And when you're in this current marketplace with American talent, talent in Major League Soccer, that is growing both in a financial sense and in an ability sense, and you're getting these kinds of numbers, one, it doesn't hurt to listen if you're a front office. Atlanta United has said and proven in the past that they are going to listen when someone comes knocking on your door. But they're not just going to sit there and say, yeah, okay, that first price, we're going to go ahead. That's a great idea. We'll go ahead and cash in now. No. What you're doing if you do something like that is you're underselling yourselves as an entity to the world marketplace. If you take that first offer, then the next guy that comes along, you know, it could be, let's say for the sake of example, George Bellow. If George Bellow, if Battleship Galatasaray comes, and sits there and says, okay, and they have this thought process. Okay, well, Atlanta United, the last time, someone came in with that first offer, and Atlanta United took it. So if we sit there and we give them an offer that we think is probably below value, but we think it can actually get something done, we'll go ahead and do that too. Atlanta United is listening to the marketplace. They're not just jumping on an initial assessment, whatever that initial assessment is. That's good business by Atlanta United to do stuff like that instead of sitting there and jumping on that first number. Once again, it's just all a part of this process where a league is growing and a franchise is being recognized for its talent that it's developing on the world stage. And there are a lot of things in play here when it comes to negotiations and players and what's best for the player, what the player thinks is best for the player, the team doing on the solid, all these kinds of things we've been talking about for the last little bit. But there's a lot of things in play as the marketplace continues to grow, Jason, where Major League Soccer is concerned. So just keep an eye on what's going on. And no one sell, no one should sell for the sake of that first offer coming in and jumping in an offer because you sit there and you sit there and you make yourself a mark for future offers if you do something like that. Yeah, this is going to get interesting if there is any legitimacy to it. And and look, that still has to be a question. Is there anything legit to it? Keep in mind, nobody had Augsburg as the team that was going to get Ricardo Pepe until two days before it went official, if I'm not mistaken, maybe a day before. Um, everything's moving really fast in 2022, but it, it was expected he was going to go elsewhere. And for a lot less money. And then the Augsburg deal popped up really quickly to the point that there are all kinds of rumors that, oh, Bayern kicked in on the money and they did that with Serge Gnabry and uh, all more rumors and crazy speculation. It is the largest transfer that Augsburg has ever made. It, it is the largest transfer for a Bundesliga club to an MLS club what Ricardo Pepe is doing. And that's been made official this morning as well. Um, I don't think he starts straight away, but they're going to try to get him in as quickly as possible. Um, probably not this weekend, but who knows? Um, what's the market for miles? I don't know. We're all guessing. Um, but I, I want to end with, with Jarrett on this because he's got to go at the, the top of the hour. I just, I, I really think that what you said about this being a world cup year could factor into this for for both sides of it not just for the club because look it uh, this whole thing gets weird at, at times with like uh, how could the club sell a player that i like because the club has to take care of the club well why would the club not sell this player because the club has to take care of the, the club the players wishes do come into that but ultimately the club has to protect the club. The front office has to protect the club. The club is going to be here longer than the player is going to be here in terms of even if they stay here for their whole career. The club's not going anywhere, so they have to do it. But this feels like a situation, Jarrett, where obviously the club could get a larger transfer if he goes to the World Cup and does well. It's always a possibility that he goes to the World Cup and doesn't do well, and then that larger deal doesn't happen. We've seen that happen too. But for from Robinson's perspective, there's the potential for a better offer and a better salary and a better deal if he goes to the World Cup and does well. That's on the table, too. 
it's also on the table for the third leg of this, which is the team that's buying. Uh, you know, I wouldn't blame a team at all for even in this. This goes for Atlanta, too. If you're looking at players you want to bring in and say, hey, if we can get him in before the World Cup window when his value might explode, that would be great because then he can play for us. If he explodes at the World Cup, then when we sell him down the road, which God bless you, Augsburg, you're not the final destination for, uh, you know, for for a lot of big name players. Uh, if you can get him in before that window and get him at a lower price and then his value skyrockets, that's more money for a buying club in those situations. Uh, but yeah, if you're Atlanta, you want to, you want to hang on and maximize the value. And especially if Miles Robinson continues to be one of the best center backs in MLS and one of the best center backs on this continent, then yes, you would like to keep him for a run because you believe that 2022 is a year in which you can make a run because you will have Luis Araujo for an entire season, predictably. Um, Marcelino Moreno and or Ezequiel Barco being involved in things. Uh, Joseph Martinez, a full year removed from knee injury and knee surgery. Excuse me, knee surgery. Um, there's a, you know, getting Brooks Lennon integrated with a guy like, like a Joseph Martinez, more so than they were able to before. You have young players who will be in the fold as well. And, this is going to be this is going to be, I think, a year that you're really looking at hard if you're Atlanta United to say we're gonna have an entire off season. We don't have CONCACAF Champions League, more's the pity. So we are gonna be able to focus on getting out of the gates fast, get into the US Open Cup play, which you know will be important because the club has made it stated that it's important. They've already won one US Open Cup. Mm-hmm. And you have a manager who came from Seattle, the club who I don't want to say they originated the MLS club taking Open Cup seriously because Seattle invented everything. But it's 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 a club that the U.S. Open Cup was very important to there, so he understands that. Should be a very big year. It'd be great to have Miles Robinson here the whole year while you're going through that. Yeah, and I think the the biggest thing to remember as we wait to see if there's any concrete rumor slash offer to to this conversation because that is still the number one element of all of this. Please, this is not being reported widely. This is not being reported by top tier sources and there's no indication of what the Bundesliga clubs are. And five to eight is a big range. There's a lot of questions about the initial rumor to begin with. Keep that in mind. But there is the window right now that clubs in Europe, almost all of them have until January 31st to buy. I, I, I want to say Turkey might have a few extra days. Um, then there's a window in the summer. Like there is the possibility, and then in that window is generally where there's more business done on the European side, but not always. Generally, that's where more more business is done than in this window. We're we're kind of in weird times right now and markets are changing, so that might not be the case going forward. We have a World Cup in, in the middle of the next season, which is very strange. But you've got the rest of this month to potentially sell. You've got the summer window to potentially sell and you've got the post world cup transfer window to potentially sell. So there's a lot of opportunities here. If there is not a good deal on the table for both the player and the club, they can wait till the summer. If there is not a good deal on the table for the player and the club, they can wait. And, and miles in this case, the player might choose to bet on himself in terms of waiting, going to the World Cup, lighten it up, and then immediately being in the shop window in a mid-season one, which that could be the biggest mid-season window we've ever seen in Europe. There's a lot of time. There's a lot of time for for actually a concrete rumor to come up first. <laughs> like that's what I keep coming back to is like there's a lot of time for this to get real because I don't even really think it's real yet. Let's wait and see what happens. Um, And yes, just to go ahead and cut it off, um, there could have been offers that came after the end of the season media availability where it was said that there wasn't concrete offers. That's how these things can happen. So just to cut that one off, because I'm sure that'll come up at some point. Final thoughts from you, Jarrett, before we kick you out. Uh, No, just... um... You know, we're closer to... uh, As as the calendar flips, we're, we're the first show of the new year. We're closer to the uh, MLS season starting than we 
word to it being just about like <laughs> uh, we're almost we're almost there it's it's stupid how short this offseason is going to be expect rumors fast and flurrying uh and not just with uh not just with atlanta but around the league you know we talked about lafc a bit expect rumors expect silliness um check your sources check your check marks too man check check for those fake accounts it is always fake account season Oh yeah, yeah. These are not fake accounts, luckily. But yes, no, no, good. No, these, just to be clear, yeah, these are not fake accounts <laughs> by any stretch, and they can absolutely be valid. We don't know. Um, be aware of fake account season because it never ends, though. From people making fake Fabrizio Romano accounts, mm-hmm. um, you know, um, that, I think that's how you know you've made it as an insider. People yes. start making fake accounts about you. There is a Fabrizio. Frab- Romano, Fabrizio Romano, yeah. I think, or something. Well, I think it's com it's common to use like the seven in the circle yeah. in place of the check mark because if you glance at it quickly, it looks like a check mark and think, ah, this is legit. And then you check and see that it has thirty five followers and is based somewhere out of Macedonia. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> all the things. Um, all right, Jarrett, you going to be with us on uh, soccer over there this evening? That's the plan because, like, as I was reminded yesterday. I'm still pissed off about the fact that, uh, you know, uh, Ter Stegen's making amazing saves with his wing. That was an amazing save. And and you uh, needed that to be a goal because you picked that to be a draw. I did. And Sorry. I forgot I picked it to be a draw. I blame the after effects of COVID. Yeah, there were a couple of us who believed in Barcelona. And uh, the, the winner has been decided. It is not going to come down to, I, I thought it might, the final game in the Premier League match day uh, and cards issued in it. Um, although it could decide who comes in second. We'll see how it goes, but we'll talk about That's that exciting. tonight. Uh, Jarrett, thank you for joining us in our new little studio, and uh, we will see you tonight. Sounds good. Ad- adios. All right, let's go to that now kind of bouncing around looks and stuff. Um, you're not going to hear the music. That is one thing that we're working towards and I'm going to have to continue to build up. And uh, John said he could never hear it anyway, so it's nothing new. Yeah. So uh, John's going to do a dry read of Toka Football and Eliminize, our presenting sponsors for 2022. Friends, do you have a young soccer player in your family? Have you ever considered, ever, 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 considered private instruction with a professional instructor to take your favorite player's game to the next level? Toka Football has four, one, two, three, four indoor soccer training centers in the Atlanta area. Their trainers utilize innovative technology in a fun environment to help improve your favorite player's skill and decision-making. Give Toka Football a try, won't you? Here's how you do it. SDH is partnering with Toka to offer our listeners an opportunity to check out their revolutionary and fun Toka soccer training method for no cost whatsoever. Book your $0 session right now with the promo code DH. See, D-H, that's your promo code. Go to tokafootball.com backslash program backslash toka dash training. Tokafootball.com backslash program backslash T-O-C-A dash training or go to soccerdownhere.net. Click on the Toka Football banner and get your favorite player's game headed to the next level right now. SDH is also brought to you by our friends at Elimini Service. Over my left shoulder for odor-free, clean, fresh air. One place you need to go. And it's eliminized. They deodorize enclosed spaces like houses, apartments, and condos. They've created a customized solution that eliminizes all organic odors, including those like pet cigarettes or food. Realtors and property managers use eliminize to eliminize bad odors to help them sell or rent their homes that much faster. They offer a turnkey process that makes it easy to work with realtors and property managers, offering a green way to get rid of odors without any kind of toxic residue whatsoever. Different than Febreze or other masking agents that we might have under our favorite sink, they use a proven scientific formula to destroy odor down to the molecule. Pricing is easy, parts per million or by cubic feet to come up with a price that's affordable for you. Results in 24 hours or less. If you have any other questions frequently asked or otherwise, go to the Eliminize website, E-L-I-M-I-N-I-Z-E dot com backslash Atlanta. That's the key part, the backslash Atlanta, so they know what part of the world you are contacting them from. For odor-free, clean, fresh air, it is Eliminize Service, E-L-I-M-I-N-I-Z-E dot com backslash Atlanta. Proud sponsors of everything. SDH. Thank you, Eliminize and Toka Football. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching today. We're going to continue more on MLS. So if you have some questions, you can fire them off and we'll get into them. There's a bunch of other MLS stuff to jump into. Uh, soccer over there tonight, 705. We'll get into a lot of the stuff from overseas. Barcelona with their win. Real Madrid was pretty much crap. 
in their first game back from the break. And Carlo Ancelotti said the same uh, 45 minutes of insanity with Chelsea and Liverpool. And then I think they were gassed for the mm-hmm. second 45. Um, Arsenal was great, but lost. Manchester City was not great, but won. Um, refereeing decisions, all the usual chaos. We'll get into all of that silly season stuff as well. We'll talk a little bit about it um, here before we finish, but that'll be tonight, 7.05, as well as the picks of the week. Everybody's waiting to see if Green Mamba FC got the win in, in their match. Other MLS stuff, Caden Clark. He is now an RB Leipzig player, but he is not going to go to Leipzig right now. He's going to stay in New York. Uh, according to Build, he will be loaned back to the Red Bulls. And Derek Ray uh, had the information first in English um, that, according to Build, it, it makes no sense right now to bring Clark over during this Corona spike and with all the assorted difficulties of that. So he's going to stay at Red Bulls. Is that for the first half of the MLS season and he goes to join Leipzig's preseason camp? That's kind of my guess. That would make the most sense. Um, a little more time wouldn't hurt him right now. I don't think he's ready to step in and play at Leipzig straight away. But whether he goes to Leipzig or he is loaned to Salzburg or somewhere else, yeah, this is probably the right move at this point uh, with everything going on. And I, I do think the the Corona issue is is there too for him. Um, this makes a lot of sense. I just don't know if he really fits into what New York is doing because he wasn't a regular for them last season. Gerhard Struber is is much more along the old school Red Bull lines of press, 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 press. We don't really want the ball. And Caden Clark, to me, is a playmaker. He, he's a guy who needs to be on the ball. So the loan back to New York, I get it. He's not going to play at Leipzig, but is he going to play a lot at New York? I don't know if he will. I, I don't know if this really helps his development at all. It might need to have him go somewhere else in the summer. And that's the key, you know, when you when we've talked about players and transfers and things like this, once again, for me, this comes down to playing time in a system in an idea that was counter to what you were doing before. And so Caden Clark was doing one thing and now you're having to possibly come back and you're doing something counter to what you were doing. You're almost having to retrain yourself if you're Caden Clark to come back and be an what? integral part. Well, no, it's just what I'm saying is, is that you're playing, you were playing a particular way, yeah, in Europe. And no, now, he wasn't. He hasn't been in Europe, John. Okay. Well, he was, was here last season. That's right. That's mine. But okay, so my my thought is this: if you're going to do one, if you're doing things one way, then you're having to go back and almost retrain yourself to doing something as a as a playmaker that we know that you are. It's counter to what Gerhard Struber wants to do with Red Bulls. And so where does this, it's a square peg round hole for me where Caden Clark is concerned, because if you're the kind of player that we've seen Caden Clark to be in this system, it doesn't fit. And so it's, it's going to be, it's an odd look for me as to what Caden Clark is going to be doing with Red Bulls now that, you know, it looks like he's back for another season. It's, it's less of an odd look than him going to Leipzig and not playing. True. I I mean, that's the easy thing here. Um, Does he embrace more of the Red Bull way of playing with another year at New York, which should help him in terms of going to Leipzig? Uh, It's a very different way of playing than I think he came up in. Um, Not mistaken, he spent some time at the Barcelona Academy out in Arizona. So that's different. It's not completely foreign. Again, because your your Barcelona mentality, there's a, a, a very important delineation between your Barcelona's and your Leipzig's and Leipzig going back to classic Leipzig, not the Julian Nagelsmann variety of Leipzig, the very Ralph Rangnick pressing style. The delineation is Barcelona will press to get the ball back because they want the ball. The Red Bull teams and Rangnick, and this is something that I I think the English pundits are, are really starting maybe to understand a little bit in that they have to look at Rangnick and look at Manchester United through a different set of glasses because it's not the same as anything else they've really seen. It's not even your Jurgen Klopp's and Thomas Tuchel's. It is 
we don't care about possession. I mean, I, I see people like getting hung up on, well, they're not connecting passes. Their their passing percentage is low. They don't care. They, they, they don't care about extended possession. Everything to them is to press. And they create opportunities through pressing. A Barcelona presses to get the ball back to create opportunities with the ball. Caden Clark is a player who fits better into the Barcelona style of things to get very broad. There's plenty of teams that play that way. It's just the easy touchstone. He fits better into that, in my opinion, because I think he's a good ball player. He's good with the ball at his feet. Can he, with another six months training under Gerhard Struber, become more of a player who can still do those things when he does have the ball, can make things happen, but can be effective pressing? Because I think that was what was keeping him off the field. And he had injuries and and he had some issues as well. But he's going to have to show that he can do the things that a Red Bull style manager like Gerhard Struber wants to be able to play at Leipzig. This gives them time to make that decision. So he gets six months. He doesn't have to deal with with COVID issues and disruptions and, and potential chaos and all of that. So he stays where he is. He gets six months. Then they can make a decision. Is he ready to come into preseason at Leipzig ahead of next season? Is he ready to go to Salzburg versus New York at that stage? Or maybe is it? Do something else. Maybe he isn't that kind of a fit. Maybe, yes, he's a Leipzig player, but maybe they sell him on to somebody else or loan him elsewhere. It gives him more time. So it just makes sense. It just makes more sense. Yeah, Barcelona, Arizona Academy. Thank you, Modiflo. I was I was almost positive of that. Um, he, he's a good player. And I just don't know if he's a good Red Bull player. They don't have to try to squeeze him into Leipzig right now. He doesn't have to get overwhelmed. I think after the year he had at New York, he he needs more time. I just hope he plays at New York. Um, if he's good enough. I mean, that's the thing. He's got to be good enough to get on the field. You don't just play him to play him because, you know, you want to. He has to earn it. It's the thing about young players. There, there's not easy answers to that development because it's just never in a straight line. Uh yeah, part the the Min- Minnesota getting money from the Caden Clark situation is one of the more ridiculous things in MLS history because he played for an affiliated academy club with Minnesota United before he went to Barcelona Arizona Academy if I'm not mistaken. And somehow that was able to get Minnesota some kind of rights to him which shouldn't have happened and red bulls had to pay to get it done i want to say it was 75 grand it wasn't absurd but it was still absurd that it even happened because he went to red bulls too and it was right before he played against atlanta in 2020 if i remember correctly um that was one of his first games they paid the price to get him from minnesota for rights even though they shouldn't have had any rights and then he did very very well um this is a big year for caden clark It's a big year for a lot of young American players, but Clark is one to keep an eye on, not so much for this World Cup cycle, but for down the road in 26. I just wonder what's going to be next for him. Other MLS stuff. Lorenzo Insigne's agent will reportedly meet with Toronto FC officials in Rome on Friday. Uh, Insigne is back with Napoli. He has tested negative for COVID after a previous positive test, and he will be available to play on Thursday when they return to action. Um, but they're going to meet on Friday. He's going to be there. According to the Corriere del Mezzogiorno newspaper, um, the meeting set for Friday, Insigne's agent, Vincenzo uh, Pisacane, and go. thanks, John, and Insigne are going to be there. <laughs> and uh, the report states that Insigne is going to make it clear that he is not leaving until the end of the Serie A season. Uh, he wants to finish out the year at Napoli. But that also means Napoli is not going to get anything in return. No transfer fee for him. Um, yeah, Modiflo, uh, back to Caden Clark. He played for Minnesota Thunder. It was one of their affiliated clubs. Minnesota Thunder shares the name of the old A-League um, club back in the day that turned into Minnesota Stars and all the different things and ended up Minnesota United. But Thunder's a a youth club there, and he was there. And they were some affiliate of Minnesota United's academy or youth or whatever, and it's still shady. Completely and utterly shady. Um, 
so Napoli's not going to get a transfer fee. The numbers are all over the map on Insigne, but I think it's whittled down to where most of the reputable sources are saying 11.5 million net in salary. Um, I've seen a few say that's gross and there'd be taxes, but which is possible, but it seems like more are saying that's net. It's just an absurd raise from what he's making now and an even more absurd raise from what Napoli has offered for him. Friday's the meeting. We'll see if things get nailed down with Insigne. There's also rumors that other players like Belotti, that is starting to become more of a possibility because it's the same thing as Insigne. The the money is going to be too good for him to say no to. Belotti's a little bit younger. That one feels like a little bit more of a wild card, but that rumor is still kicking up and starting to kick up a little more noise. Chicago Fire have made a signing. This is past rumor. Uh, Rafael Sichos, who is uh, with Köln in Germany, uh, 31 years old. He's played primarily as a left-footed center back, left side of the back four at Köln. Um, he's expected to be a key figure for them. It's going to be a targeted allocation money signing, so a fairly substantial um player here that they're expecting they wanted a left-footed center back according to sporting director george heights uh he's been there since 2018 111 all competition appearances across germany's uh, first and second divisions he captained holston keel as they earned promotion to the second division for the first time since 1981 that's where he was before going to cologne Chicago's defense was awful last season, so this is definitely an upgrade. Uh, some of the conversation out of Germany on this is that Cologne didn't really want to let him go, but the money was just too good for them to turn down, and that's where it stands. That's a good addition for Chicago. Uh, Daryl DK, which feels like this happened months ago, but it was just a couple of days ago. The move to West Brom is official. It's done. According to Jeff Carlisle of ESPN, $9.5 million transfer fee, performance-based bonuses, and 20% of any future sale. Uh, you follow the championship more closely than I do, John. Uh, where is West Brom, and how much will DK get on the field for them? Well, I think that considering the past relationship that their manager had with him the last time that Daryl DK had his cameo in the championship, I think that... He's going to get the reps that uh, that he got last time out. He's going to hopefully be, if you're a West Brom fan, one of the guys that's going to get you closer to the promotion discussion, if not one of those promotion, the immediate promotion spots and getting out of the playoff. Right now, West Brom is fourth in the table. They've played 25 matches. Fulham has two matches in hand above them. They're at 45. They're in this grouping from three to seven that is separated by six points. So right now they're in the the promotion playoff discussion. I know that they want to try to get into those automatic spots right now. They're four points behind Blackburn, who's at 46 points, and Bournemouth right now is at 49. They're at the top of the championship. So I would anticipate that once uh, they get to the, uh, the health and fitness squared away with DK, that he's going to be playing a lot. And he's, uh, you know, I think it was a goal every other match last time that he was in the championship. So uh, I think that they're looking at him as one of those key cogs that will get them into the automatic promotion spots. For me, I'm looking at, you know, 10 million for a championship club. That's a that's a bit of a heavy outlay. And I think that there's an expectation that's attached to it for a, a team right now that's fourth in the table chasing promotion. Yeah, I mean, they're going to pay that because they're not a typical championship club because they're expecting to get promoted. And if if not now, next year, they're going to be pushing for that. Um, the relationship previously, I think, is important. He, he played for this manager at Barnsley and did really well. So he's a known quantity, probably desired by the manager, brought in specifically for what he did before. Uh, Modiflo, or sorry, uh, Walchara asked, um, did Orlando fumble the bag? Should they have sold earlier? I don't know if we truly know what offers were there for him earlier. Um, if they fumbled it, they didn't fumble it that badly. They still got a good return. That 20% of a future sale will help them as well. I don't know what the performance-based bonuses can kick this up to. 
I just don't know how much concrete there was to previous rumors about real offers. Like, I think there was the expectation that Orlando was going to wait for twenty million. That seemed a little crazy. Um, and and yes, I think comparing DK to Ricardo Pepe is, is incorrect. I think Pepe is younger. I think he's got more promise. I think he's a more well-rounded player. I'm I'm not sure where the narrative is coming up now that DK will be better for the national team because of this move than Pepe will. I think Pepe's a much better player. I think DK is a very good fit for the championship and for a bottom half premiership team. I think he's a very good fit for that style of play. Um, I think Pepe is a better all around player. Doesn't mean you won't see both at times for the national team. And it doesn't mean that forms won't change and that won't push guys better than their better different ways. But I think Orlando did pretty well with this. I think it's pretty good business. Um, they couldn't continue on at this point. I, I don't think it would have made any sense to keep him here any longer to wait for something better. Go into this year with a clean slate and get it started. Um, New York City got Maxi Morales back under contract. That was a big one for them, and he's not a designated player either. The deal is below the financial threshold to be a DP. Big return for them. That was one of the big questions. Um, the biggest question now for NYC is Tati Castellanos. And what is his valuation? And Roberto Abramovitz, who does Spanish language radio for NYC, is is kind of on the same page that that I was when we heard the 9.5 for DK and the, the 20 for Pepe. What is Tati Castellanos' valuation? Because we had heard 10 to 12 million is what was being offered from Palmeiras in Brazil. Castellanos has said he'd love to go to Italy. We've heard that NYC wanted 15. Can NYC get even more than 15 now because of what Pepe has gone for? Yeah, I I think so. I think 15 should be the floor now uh, of what they can expect to get. And I think they could get somewhere in the 15 to 18. But where? Don't know. Um, could it be another German club? We haven't heard much of anything about that with Castellanos. Genoa has been linked. I don't know if Genoa can go a whole lot higher than 10, but we'll have to find out. Um, Castellanos is the big one to watch now because I don't think he's in MLS next year. I, I think they need to sell now rather than than wait and hold on to him. I don't know how much else he can really do at, at New York City. So, all right, where and how much and if Brazil is the club or Palmeiras is the club out of Brazil that comes with the most money, is that where he wants to go or would he rather stay in New York and wait? Um they might need to push Pep Guardiola to mention him a couple more times in, in press conferences and stuff. That'll help bump that number up a little bit more. Uh, Albert Rusnak linked to the Seattle Sounders, according to our friend Nico Moreno and Jeremiah Oshan of Sounder at Heart. 27 years old, Slovakian international. He's been a DP and a captain for RSL. 41 goals, 39 assists across 140 appearances for RSL since coming to the league in 2017. That's a huge signing for Seattle. That's a really good get for Seattle if they can get him really good get um totally on board with it totally on board from Seattle's perspective if they get him take some pressure off of Lodero who is slowing down I mean just it's part of what happens to all of us we all slow down as we get a little bit older and, and Nico Lodero's had more injuries and is, is starting to do that but you throw Rusnak into that midfield and if they stick with and, and this would be my biggest question is the Raul Rui Diaz conversation is still out there. Does he want to push for a move or is he going to stay? Um, are you going to play two up top or are you going to go back to a 4-3-3? If you go 4-3-3 with Jordan Morris back with Leo Chu into the team now and you're going to play three midfielders, somebody's an odd man out because you have Joao Paulo, you have Nico Ladero, you have Christian Roldan. You have Leo Chu and Jordan Morris as wingers. You have Raul Rui Diaz up top. Now, you will have some rotation, and, and Christian Roldan is a player who can play out wide. He can play as the, the eight. He can play as the 10. He, he can bounce around a little bit. But does he become 
a super sub in some ways and and get time when Nildero can't play and Roldan gets that game. Does, does Roldan kind of play all over the midfield and maybe not start every game in the same position, but start a lot of games because he's bouncing around? Maybe so. They add Rusnak. That's a good get because he's a great player. But John, defensively, they have on, at fullback, Jimmy Madronda and Brad Smith. They don't have a right back at the moment. Uh, they are still, I believe, in negotiations with Alex Roldan. They have Nuhu. They have Suzoko, who they signed late in the season. Um, young player. They have Yemar Andrade. They have Xavier Ariaga. So center backs are in pretty good shape. But they don't have a ton of depth, and they need a fullback. If they get Rusnak, how much room do they have? And then they create a little bit of redundancy in the midfield at times. Yep, and it kind of lends itself to me to the question that we had in the first in the first hour involving Vegas Lights, LAFC, and Steve Chirundolo. Considering what Brian Schmetzer had to do last year out of necessity, do we see players that were in Tacoma last year that proved themselves in their cup of coffee that they had in Seattle out of necessity last year? Are they the ones that fill those spots that can help you out when it comes to inexpensive depth and working their way to fill the roster, knowing what you've just discussed and laying out what the presentation could be for Seattle uh, up top in, in 2022. So, I mean, that's that's my first inclination is to think Tacoma and promote to help you out in that regard, like we could see with Vegas and LAFC in the same situation financially. Yeah, um, it's possible. I mean, I don't know if promoting from Tacoma is going to be enough keep Seattle in that top three. I mean, because then you're getting back to the question we had about LAFC and Colorado and Portland and the LA Galaxy. You're not going to be happy with being the number eight team. Like, is promoting a right back from Tacoma or promoting some depth from Tacoma, is that enough to be in the top three in the West? I I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't know if that's going to be enough for them. We'll see. We'll see. Um, other stuff from MLS. Uh, Chris Mueller is at Hibs now in Scotland, but he had an interesting quote about Orlando and how they trained. I mean, first off, he said saying goodbye to Orlando was bittersweet. Leaving was tough. Had so many good years there. Didn't leave on the highest note because I wanted to win and perform better throughout the year. Chris Mueller talking about last season at Orlando. But talking about his first training sessions at Hibs. He said, the training I've seen has been more intense and more rapid than Orlando. Shorter bursts and more intense, but there's also gym work. At Orlando, we spend a lot of time on the pitch, but no gym work. Okay. Um, That would, it's not a right or a wrong thing because it depends on, you know, what you're doing in the gym. If you're using the gym to try to deal with your, cardio and and endurance and all that i i think you're wasting time um if you're using the gym in a very targeted way for like explosiveness for some some muscle building obviously things like that rehab obviously but that's a whole separate conversation the gym can be a a good supplement um is pareja and i I don't know enough but the, the sense i've always had from him is he of the mind like your Guardiola's and such um, your Mourinho's as well. This is do- something they do have in common where they do a lot of their fitness work with the ball. Everything's with a ball. Everything's about using the ball and, and game like situations and all of that um, to the point that they don't use the gym for, for anything other than that. Uh, I think those guys probably use the gym a little bit more. I mean, according to Chris Mueller, Orlando, that's no gym work, which could be a bit of an exaggeration. Um, in Scotland, are they not doing as much with the ball to get that fitness? And they feel like the gym is an added component to it. It, It's something that every manager has their own perspective on it. Uh, I always remember in David Beckham's autobiography, when he talked about going to Madrid, the difference in training in Manchester under Sir Alex Ferguson to Madrid. And I, can't remember who was his first manager there but his first season he felt like he wasn't getting enough work at madrid on the field he didn't feel the same way physically because the sessions were different probably a little bit slower pace not quite as intense 
Okay. So he started working in the gym on his own and he added some muscle and he was probably like more, more ripped and more muscular than he had ever been in his career, but it affected him in a negative sense because it slowed him down a little bit. He didn't have that explosiveness that he had before the, the quickness. So he had to adapt and come back to find that balance. I think anytime you move and you go to a different kind of training situation, some players fit better in different systems than others. But this is something that I'll be very curious to watch with Mueller to see how he does at Hibbs because I, I just don't know. He, he didn't have a good year last year. Maybe the move was in his head. But I'm also going to be watching Orlando now. And, and I haven't ever noticed them have any issues with fitness or anything like that. I think they're generally fine. But the no gym work thing, I wonder if there will be questions from Orlando media about Mueller's comment. Um, it's not a good or a bad thing. It's just a thing. It's just a little strange that they he would say they have no gym work. I'd assume they'd have some, at least in preseason. Yeah, I mean, for me, when you mention no gym work, it, it just it instantly translates to the notion of, okay, we're going to work on endurance, and that's going to be out on the pitch. We're going to try and do everything that's associated with uh, being out there for 90 minutes or being out there for however many you want to be to make sure that you're as fit and as healthy in a 90 minute construct as humanly possible. And that you might do gym work is, you know, just on your own to kind of maintain some kind of muscle mass or whatever. But uh, it's, it's an interesting thing to hear from Mueller about no gym work in Orlando, but now there is at Hibs and how does that translate to the new Chris Mueller with that he's now going to be in the SPFL and how different is it? But yeah, I've never, I've never thought of, of, of Orlando to, to have any kind of issue on the pitch when it comes to musculature or conditioning or anything like that. So when he said no gym work, it just meant that everything to me was going to be out there on grass or on turf. And that's how you were going to be as fit as possible. Yeah. I mean, there's different mentalities in the way the teams play too. And I think that's going to factor into this because Hibs is not exactly the uh, greatest possession team you've ever seen in the history of the world. Um, they generally play pretty direct and you probably are going to have to replicate some things in the gym to get that fitness up because you're just not going to be working on those things with the ball in the same way that Orlando did. So very interesting to see just one of those comments that you don't always hear about how teams train. That is kind of like, huh, interesting. Um, one more on MLS, Sean Davis, who is reportedly headed to Nashville. That has not been made official yet, although everybody's reported it as a done deal. Um, once a Metro, the SB Nation blog that covers the Red Bulls stated that their sources told them that the Red Bulls had been in negotiations with Sean Davis up until last week, had offered a three-year deal of maximum salary budget charge value below designated player status. That's the way that they word it, which is a little clunky. Now, this was the follow-up to that from the Once a Metro article, which is interesting on, on two, two different fronts. Such a contract would have been a pay bump well beyond the capped 15% raise that other MLS teams are allowed to offer Davis under league free agency rules, meaning that the freehold native, uh, Sean Davis, would be either moving overseas or has chosen to move on within MLS for personal and slash or footballing reasons rather than financial ones. So one thing it shows you is that teams can resign their own free agents for more money than the max salary or the max raise that you can get in free agency. So it's not quite what we've said that we'd love to see MLS do where they create a Larry Bird rule situation where you can go above the cap. You can't do that. But you can go, if you're re-signing your own player in free agency, you can go above the max 15% raise that other teams can give. So you do have an advantage in re-signing your own players. That's number one. A little bit of clarity there. That's good. Two is he's going to Nashville for less money, it sounds like. And that should be a wake-up call for the Red Bulls, in my opinion. You know, I, I wondered why the Red Bulls didn't get a deal done. It sounds like they tried to do everything they could to get a deal done, and they can't get it. Because he wants to go somewhere that has a better chance to win, it seems like. I mean, I think when you look at those two teams on paper, Nashville has a better chance of winning MLS Cup next year than the Red Bulls do. I think Nashville just has a better chance of being successful than the Red Bulls do. 
And is this going to become a recurring issue for the New York Red Bulls? Uh, I don't know. But this has to be a bit of a wake-up call. And and I don't know if they even see it as a wake-up call because I don't know what their long-term goals are. They're kind of a hard team to read at times. Are they going to see this as, okay, we, we've got to try to win more in this league. We should. We're, we're losing important players. We're losing captains. We're, we're, we're losing guys that should be here. Or do they see this as just the nature of what New York Red Bulls is? where they're going to have guys come through. They're going to have guys move on for more money elsewhere. They are going to develop players. Now, they're not getting the return on him that they should be getting if that's the mentality. If it's, we're going to develop guys, and if we win, that's great, but we're going to develop guys and move them on. Okay, then bring in some cash. Now, that gets back to the whole Red Bull idea, and this is where they're in a very weird spot. With the whole platform, go all the way up to Leipzig. They don't, have to sell players because they're freaking Red Bulls. They have money. I'm helping them, I guess. They they have plenty of cash. So they can almost do this thing with New York, with other Red Bull clubs. Um, Bragantino's turned into something interesting to watch in Brazil. Salzburg dominates Austria. Leipzig is trying to get over that hump of, in my opinion, being too big of a club, too strong of a team to be the pressing mentality all the time because teams will sit back against them, not let them press. They have to have more to it. They're, they're in a little bit of an identity crisis. But are they just going to use these other teams as we don't have to like develop guys to sell them on to make the business model work. We're just looking for the diamond in the rough. We're basically looking for lottery tickets for Tyler Adams's. You know, we're, we're looking for guys who come through and can make it all the way to Leipzig. And if the other guys don't, then ah, whatever. We don't really have to worry about it. You can find a middle ground and be a very smart business if they're just going to be what it appears that they are. A club that will play a certain way. A club that will have players that are developed pretty well to play in that way. And a club that will, when the time comes, watch those players leave for whatever reason, whether you're going to sell them or whether you're going to let them walk. And reload looking for the next guy who can make it to Leipzig. You can still make money in that model and still be a little more smart financially. But that appears to be the model they've chosen. And I think Sean Davis walking really reiterates that. When I saw that Sean Davis left and went to Nashville, the first thing that entered my head was that Sean Davis wanted to go someplace where he could win a championship. And being in Nashville, I, I think, gets him a lot closer to that than Red Bulls. And, and I think that where Red Bulls are concerned, I think that, yes, I think that your theory about what they can do makes a lot of sense. But I think that right now it's like, all right, what right, we're, we're going to be us. And in our negotiations, we're not going to deviate from who we are in, in a personality. And Sean Davis seeing this saw Nashville as an opportunity to continue to get closer and closer to a championship. I think that, honestly, I, I don't think I'm in the minority opinion. I think that Nashville's a lot closer to winning the Eastern Conference than Red Bulls are right Yeah, th- you're not out on a limb there. That's, yeah. a, that's a pretty easy one. Yeah. It's just, I think, maybe this is why it's so hard for Red Bulls to connect at this point with the fan base, with all of it, because what am I judging their success on right now? I, and I guess you're having to judge their success on how many players they send through to Leipzig because I don't see their success being judged on being a smart selling club because they didn't sell Aaron long. That's the, again, different, very different situation than the rumors about miles Robinson, but they didn't sell Aaron long when they had a potentially pretty good return. Um, they have made moves within the league, but generally for allocation money, which doesn't really translate to straight cash. Sean Davis walks. Other guys have walked. You know, uh, Kyle Duncan walked, which I, I don't get why you don't get something out of Kyle Duncan twice because he, he came to your academy. He didn't sign him. He goes to Europe. He comes back. Then you let him walk at the end of a contract again. He goes back to Europe. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. So you can't judge him on like being a seller. And, and okay, where they're making good moves or bringing money into the club, that's going to get invested into the academy. You can't judge it on that. 
they don't need the investment in the academy because Red Bull can cut the checks based off their peach variety and now the watermelon variety of all the money they're bringing in from me and others. Mm -hmm. Um, So you're not judging them on winning things, not anymore. So I guess we're judging them on when they produce another Tyler Adams, a guy who goes to Leipzig. Caden Clark, I mean, isn't really a Red Bull product. Uh, You can't, I mean, you have to give them credit for signing him, but they didn't develop him. So not even really given that, Um, but they signed him and I can't, I'm always reluctant to say they made him better. They gave him a bigger platform than he had. That's true. But have they improved him? Well, he's not going to Leipzig now. He's going to get loaned back to New York, at least for a short period of time. I, it's all interesting with the Red Bulls. And, and and this is maybe just what makes it hard for them to connect with a fan base because that fan base has dissipated in a very, very big way mm-hmm. from their heyday where they were a contender to win things. And I think it just shows you something that MLS has to keep in mind with all of the news from this weekend, which is, is great news from the league perspective of selling Pepe, selling DK, uh, sale, sell, sell, all the other rumors, all the possibilities, like all that is great. And, and it's it's great for us to talk about. It's great for, you know, the uh, hardcores to dig into and talk about. Is that a good deal? Is that a bad deal? All those different things. It's good. It's not a bad thing. It's good. But ultimately, MLS teams have to balance that with winning. And we've watched it here in Atlanta where players have been moved on. And I think at times there's not a fair conversation about what has been brought in in return, you know, for a player that was well-liked for a player that helped win something, win MLS cup, win the open cup. Um, it, it It's tough because the winning is what it's going to come down to. It's what it's come down to at Red Bull arena. It's what will be needed here. It's what will be needed in L.A. Like, I mean, I don't think the LAFC fan base is going to be happy about Edward Atuesta being sold and and be celebrating that if they don't win. You know, like at some point, the winning has to be there, too. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's the conversation. And that's the balance. This is great for Dallas. They sold Ricardo Pepe for all this. Okay, cool. Are you going to be a contender in the West? Are you going to be able to get back into the playoffs in the West? Okay, Orlando sold Daryl DK. Yeah, it needed to happen. Good deal. All right, now what? Is Orlando going to get over the hump of being now the the hump that they've gotten to of fifth, fourth in the East? A couple years of that. Okay. They've established themselves. Can Oscar Pereja take them further? Because if not, ultimately you run the risk of doing what is happening with Red Bulls, where they're losing some of those connections because they've went from a club that hasn't won an MLS cup, went to one in 2008, three supporter shields, which are great dinner plates, but they are supporter shields. And now they don't mean quite as much as they used to. They did mean more when they won them to be absolutely fair, but that wasn't enough. And they went from being the Thierry Henry's Cahill's Rafa Marquez's, bringing in names to saying, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to go down the Red Bull rabbit hole and be the pressing team and play in this way. And that's going to help us bring young guys through. But even the Academy feels like it's stalled a little bit. You're not bringing as many local guys through that fit. So what's their identity? Selling is good. Selling is needed. In MLS, you are incentivized to sell. If you do it well and you use the MLS rules to your advantage, you have a bigger salary cap when you make these moves. And that means you can have a better team. And that's ultimately going to give you a better chance to win. So selling is needed. Selling is an important part of building this team. But you've got to maintain identities. And ultimately, I think you've got to win to back all of it up. For me, with a couple of the clubs that you were discussing here, Red Bulls two last year in USL championship were seven, 18 and seven next to last in the Atlantic above Loudoun United. But that's not what we judge them on, John. Right. Cause we talk about this with Atlanta United too. So, I mean, the record 
doesn't really judge them. How many players are coming through Red Bulls too and going into the first team? That's what we're judging them on. Haven't seen a whole lot recently do that and make that yeah. jump. John Tolkien is one, and Tolkien's a, a good prospect. Um, I think Kyle Duncan did, but then went to Europe and he came back. Um, Barlow did, but it feels like he's kind of stalled out at where he is. Um, Caceres did, and he's come good. Um, I It took him a little bit longer. I wasn't sure if he was going to be the guy, but he had a good year last year. It looks like he's going to be back this year, although there is some conversation that maybe a move happens for him. There's been a few, but not enough to justify the way they have built their team. The record, I don't really care. I mean, the, the record, they have fallen off in terms of where Red Bulls 2 used to be in terms of winning games, but I don't think that's, I don't think that matters. Put a, a banner up arena of what they've done yeah here's and i don't think they're really doing that in large numbers large enough numbers anyway yeah you look at you look at the the number of players that are i think ready for that that next level and in watching them last year i can't really sit there and say i can pinpoint you know one two three four dudes that will be ready to compete for spots uh, for the parent club you mentioned Orlando and you mentioned FC Dallas. I want to see how Orlando invests at nine and a half or, or whatever the, if it's even doled out incrementally, I want to see where they look to replace Daryl DK with that nine and a half. And I also saw something in uh, a lot of the, the social media that was attached to this sale on the weekend of Ricardo Pepe before it was made official this morning. When that $20 million number was floated out there, everyone was sitting there saying, okay, you've got to take that $20 million and you've got to bring in high price talent and you've got to, you got to, you got to, you got to, to improve where we were. But I wonder how much of that is going to be laid out for talent and how much of that gets reinvested in the academy, knowing what we've seen from the academy and how they want to build from within. Well, remember with, with how this works, too, you, you can't take that 20 and put all of it into your roster. And I think a lot of folks miss out on that idea. They think that that $20 million is going to be there, and as lump uh -huh. sum, you're throwing that in. I think a lot of folks miss that. No. I mean, Pepe is off the roster. He wasn't on a large contract. You have that roster spot, that cap space. You have the cash that you bring in. Um you do get allocation money out of it, which will be very good and very substantial for them, but it's not 20 million. It's, it's, it's not. So you look at Dallas right now, you take Pepe out of it and I can officially cross him off of the Dallas depth chart that I have here. Um, and you've got Franco Hara up top who was expected to be the guy and hasn't truly been the guy. Pepe's emergence also helped with that. Um, Paul McCall, should be, you know, back to where he was, you would hope. Um, they've added some other pieces, guys that you might not know super well. Uh, Hader O'Brien, who had moments last year. Um, Sean had moments last year. Uh, in the midfield, Jesus Ferreira will be expected to be a much bigger piece, I, I think, with Pepe's absence. Um, I like Nicky Hernandez, who's a young player who came through the Dallas area, came into the academy, went to SMU. They brought him back. Uh, Cerrillo is a player who I really liked at the U20 World Cup a while back, but he hasn't made that next jump. Brandon Cervania is a guy who's spent some time over in Europe training at different points. They've got some nice pieces. Uh, the back line's pretty good. Justin Che, Ryan Hollingshead as your outside backs. Uh, Jose Martinez, they brought over from Spain last year. Matt Hedges. Okay, there's not a ton of depth, but your depth will come from your academy, you would expect. There'll be more homegrowns that come in and fit into this. That's good. Are they going to go get a striker to replace Pepe? Are they going to expect Franco Hadra to step up and Ferreira to step up? Does Ferreira move up top? Um, what do they do with the increased allocation money that they have? You know, is it a striker? Is it a 10? Is it a couple of holding midfielders? If you feel like Cerrillo and, and Cervania aren't ready to be those guys yet, although if they're not, 
when are they? Um, that's the thing that Dallas has to balance. And that's the, that's the thing where it, it doesn't make sense to just stomp your feet and say, go spend 20 million. That's not who they are. They have been true to an identity, but they also have to be, I think a little quicker in making decisions on their young players. If a guy is Weston McKinney and he's ready to step up and play minutes at 16, 17, play him those minutes. Because they didn't, and they didn't get anything for him um, outside of solidarity training money, I think. Um, Justin Che. Justin Che has been linked with Bayern. They have the relationship with Bayern. Um, that's one place that Pepe was linked, although it wouldn't make sense for him to go to Bayern right now. Okay, if Justin Che is the guy and he's getting legitimate interest in Germany, he should be starting every game. He should be the guy. And then with guys that maybe haven't, stepped up to be that guy if Sorio, for example is just he's not there he's not that level okay move him on get, move him somewhere else to bring the next kid through if that's who they are then they've got to make decisions faster sign guys younger which i think they're doing more of play guys more if they're ready and also that you, you have to move guys through when they're not gonna be at that level that's the hardest part and it always comes up when we see homegrowns not get contracts renewed Guys from the second team not make the jump to the first team, as we see here in Atlanta from time to time. That's always the hardest thing, but you have to be you have to be decisive with it. Because if you keep guys around who have not shown that they can be a 30 start a year guy in MLS, if you feel like they can get there, but they're not there yet, okay. But if they've shown that they're not and you keep them around they're blocking the development of somebody else. This was one of the biggest mistakes that Barcelona made in the 2010s, kind of after Pep and through on. They kept guys around longer than they needed to. Like, really, it's two years at the second team level. And even the second year is, is sometimes a stretch. It's two years. If they haven't shown in two years at the second team level, and for Dallas, you know, that's North Texas. That can be their their top youth team as well because they do sign guys very young because their their model's different. They haven't shown it in two years. You got to move on. You got to bring the next guy through. And Dallas would be expected to have the next guy in every position. And at North Texas, they would be expected to have those guys ready to go. You know, Nicky Hernandez could be one of those next guys this year. Okay. That's... That's what you have to get ready to, because if you hold guys in that second team, they're blocking an academy kid from coming through. If you hold guys in a, in a bench role on the first team, if you're a Dallas, not a not an Atlanta or LAFC or others who are expected every year to win MLS Cup, that's always your expectation. That is not the expectation every year at Dallas. It's just never going to be. Okay. If you're keeping a guy on your bench, as a young player who is still developing, they're going to be blocking somebody else's path. At some point, you've got to make those decisions. And, and that's, the, that's the tough part stuff. That's, that's developing a roster, especially in MLS with a cap. So Dallas bringing in a lot of money for Ricardo Pepe. That should be a, a very good advertisement for any young player within the Dallas footprint to go to Dallas, to develop at Dallas. You're going to get opportunities to play at Dallas that can get you into the national team from Dallas, and then, yeah, get a, a big payday and a, a long-term deal in the Bundesliga. It, it's it's great. Now, what do they do with it? Where do they go from here? This is one of the hardest things. That's what makes this game, when, when I think you come to MLS from other sports and, and you look at how teams build and how teams acquire talent and how teams move on from talent, it's a completely different conversation. And I think even in MLS, it's a very different conversation than it is in other soccer leagues worldwide. It's not easy. It's hard to stay at the top with all of the different elements that come up, whether it's you know offers overseas, whether it's guys who have stagnated, whether it's not having the proper development cycle in place, all these different things that just make it very, very hard. Dallas now, I think, has gotten to a point back from the Pareja days originally where they were right there. They they won a supporter shield. They could have done the treble in 2016. They won the supporter shield. They won the Open Cup. If 
Mauro Diaz didn't do his Achilles. I think I'm pretty sure it was an Achilles injury late in the season. If that didn't happen, they would have been the favorite going into the postseason. That's how close it was for them to be there. And that's 2016. I know that's a long time ago now, but that's where they were under Pereja. He leaves to go to Tijuana. They bring up Luchi Gonzalez. You had flashes. You had the 2020 year where they they advanced and, and a lot of talk and they won the shootout with Portland and okay. And it all fell back. Can Nico Estevez get them back to where Pereja had them? Because they weren't spending like a huge amount of money under Pereja either. And I don't think their academy was as good and had produced as much by that point either. The league was very different too. And maybe some of this shows you just how much MLS has improved since 2016. But can Nico Estevez, using the Dallas model, get them back to a conversation where they are like a Kansas City, where they're like a Colorado? And maybe they're not the big, sexy team spending you know, $20 million on a transfer, but they can still win. Because that's what... Dallas needs just like Red Bulls. They they need to win to energize that fan base. And you're talking about a team that won only seven matches last season, and they were 11th. I mean, the the three Texas sides were 11th, 12th, and 13th in the West. Dallas was 11th by two points over Austin, and there was a big gap from Dallas to San Jose, who was 10th at 41 points. So that's eight points. If you're just looking at it from a a numbers perspective, three wins difference, eight points difference from where they were last year to the team above them. And it's, it's going to be, and like I said, I want to see how Nico Estevez lays things out. Do you put trust in the younger guys early on? Do you have faith in them to try to get you back closer to the playoff bar? But once again, you look at the folks above them, we know that LAFC is going to have the desire to get back in the playoffs. We know that Los Angeles was an oopsie out of being in the playoffs. And you know that RSL and Vancouver, they're going to want to stay where they are. So there's going to be a lot of folks right there in that six through nine. It's going to be a long road right now, at least initially for Dallas to try to get back into that playoff discussion. So we'll continue on this conversation tonight on soccer over there, but we'll bring Liga MX into it. There's a great piece over at ESPN about Liga MX's internal transfer market and something that we've mentioned before over the years where guys are making really good money in Mexico to stay in Mexico. And you don't see as many Mexican players go to Europe. And that's one of the reasons why young guys are getting paid really, really well at younger ages than they do in MLS and they're staying and they're superstars and they're, they're everywhere, but does their development stagnate to a degree? In some cases it does. In some cases it's the right fit for that player, but we'll get into strategy and all that from a broad sense with Mexico, with other leagues in this hemisphere, but also leagues in Europe where the window is now open everywhere. You've got Julian Alvarez's agent going on tour, it sounds like, to, to Manchester, to Madrid, to Milan, to London to meet people. Um, you've got guys like Adama Traore in the window. You've got guys like Sven Botman in the window. Uh, Usman Dembele's agent is still talking like a crazy person. Uh, you got Newcastle wanting to sign six guys at least, and they're trying to get deals done, and they're throwing cash around, it sounds like. And you've got Romelu Lukaku, which maybe now um, – Romelu Lukaku's name comes up unexpectedly after his outburst uh, from three weeks ago, but it's still an outburst. And he was left out of the Chelsea squad. So we got plenty to talk about on soccer over there. That's going to be tonight at 7.05. A um, couple of, of kind of housekeeping things. So uh, for those of you who've watched on, on Twitch this morning, you see a little bit of a different layout. There's a lot of different things on the back end. So we're, we're kind of working and evolving this as we go, but this is how the, the show will generally flow in, in the mornings from here on out. It's a little bit easier on our end. Some different challenges at times, um, bringing others into the show. So kind of you know bear with us a little bit as we, we get everything worked out with our guests. Uh, we will have Dylan Butler tomorrow. We will have Mike Conti this week on Wednesday and Friday, and we will have Nico Moreno 
back on Thursday as Nico keeps breaking news everywhere. We got to catch up with him. Mm -hmm. um, so all of those things will continue. We're going to try to bring more guests in because it's a, it, it, is, it is ultimately easier in this format and it's easier to have the video. It's, it's very easy for everybody to be part of it. There's some different things on my end over here to, to balance through. So again, bear with us. But right now, while we're kind of working through all of that, for those of you who have listened to the audio only feed in the mornings, right now it's not going to be live. The podcast will get posted after the show. But right now there's not a live component. It's just the way that everything gets routed with the way that we're currently set up. It's different than it was before. Skype allowed you to do some different things that were good and bad. And one of the good things that Skype could do was I could kind of double uh, push audio feeds. I can't do that out of this right now. So right now, the live audio feed will not be happening in the mornings along with the show. So if you're listening to this podcast later and you're like, why are they talking about different formats and all this stuff? Um, if you do want to catch that live, you'll have to join us on Twitch, twitch.tv slash soccer down here. That is where it is right now, live in the morning. That could change, but right now that does not, look like it's going to change so the live show will be on twitch then the audio version will go out as soon as possible afterwards and we hope to be able to do some different things with this as well um, i'm hoping that because of this layout and because of this format it'll be really easy to do some you know like 30 minute shows on twitch when we're on the road uh with atlanta united uh, maybe some pregame shows before we do twos games uh, at, at fifth third, maybe some pregame shows from the bins uh, before we go on radio, stuff like that. This gives us a, a little bit more flexibility in doing that kind of stuff. So bear with us uh, as we work through stuff. It's, it's a new us in, in 2022, at least in some areas. Uh, soccer over there tonight, 7.05, and uh, it'll be back on Twitch, twitch.tv slash soccer down here. We'll have our picks of the week. If you have anything you want us to dig into in that and you are a subscriber, and thank you to everybody who continues to re-up your subscriptions on Twitch, re-up your subscriptions on Patreon. It allows us to grow. It allows us to do things like this. It allows us to add more components to things. Um, if you are a subscriber and you're on the Discord, Please, if you have topics you want us to get into tonight, drop them into the soccer over there section on Discord, and we will talk about those tonight. But we got Premier League, we've got La Liga, we've got Serie A coming back, we've got all the silly season stuff, and we will get into that kind of transfer strategy and take it past MLS to the whole hemisphere. So final thoughts, John, before we go. Crazy weekend that we'll get into tonight on a couple of different fronts. Obviously, a lot of folks will look at Chelsea and Liverpool, and we'll talk about that tonight. And it was, uh, it had its moments of wildness. Of course, it was the end of festive fixtures, which, of course, we all know is the greatest thing that has ever been given to the sport of soccer on this or any other planet. So we'll talk about that tonight. But uh, I'm supposed to throw shade at England, not you. Well, as a as a fan of the game in general. I, I, you know, hey, festive fixtures is the greatest thing ever. Hashtag hey, it created it created a great forty five with with Liverpool and Chelsea, which was just chaotic and yeah. frantic and oh, filled, filled with yes, after playing three matches in you know four hours and having to go back to back to back like you did in festive fixtures. Of course, you're going to have chaos because guys don't want to defend anymore. It's like nah. You know, come back to me when you're when you, we got the ball back. Whoever decides to go back and get the ball or when the, the keeper launches it forward, that's when that's when I'll get back to you. Yeah, there was a little of that. There was some sloppy play uh, as well. Uh, there was the potential for a red card in like six seconds. Yeah, that's uh, that's you know. uh, Sadio Mane going wilding, which has been known to happen before. Yeah, we'll get into all of that. But that'll be tonight, 7.05 on soccer over there. We'll be back in the morning. Uh, usual time shot at seven or nine oh five in the morning with Dylan Butler joining us. You don't get up at seven, John. I couldn't start it earlier if I wanted to. <laughs> I've already got like, you know, 10 pages of notes for the show by the time you wake up. So, well, I, I know how it goes. Because what I do is I go to bed late and get up later. That's how it's like. I'll do all my studying late yeah, at okay. night and then get up after you've already put in your 10 pages of notes. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah, we can't do an earlier show because John sleeps late. So there you go. Mm -hmm. That's it for this morning. Thanks for hanging out with us. Mucha plata, y'all. Mucha plata, y'all.